This section is about examining the role of um, really advanced technology in luxury today. Um, we'll be looking at its role within products, but also wider than that in terms of uh, its role in experience. And I guess one of the things that we're really interested to explore is if technology is relevant and present, does it add to luxury or does it actually detract from it? And I think the answer lies in that it's not that simple. In fact, in some categories, it helps, and in others, it actually completely devalues luxury. So we'll explore that, and then we'll look at, uh, beyond the product itself, if there's, a, if there's a role for technology in creating a, a relationship with luxury buyers. The, the first observation we would make is this one, that you know, luxury really is pretty complex. Uh, it's something that's deeply human, and that quite often, the closer it embraces technology, the less luxury it actually has. And if you think about that, it's not that surprising, because actually lu luxury isn't about technology, and technology isn't about luxury. Uh, in fact, technology is really sort of worshipping as a different altar altogether. Um, it's about performance. It's about making things better, faster, more accurate, more precise, more reliable. And sometimes those things are relevant to luxury, but not always and not in every case. So what we're going to do is illustrate this. And what we're showing is it happens to be about watches, but it's something that applies across lots of different luxury categories, whether it's luggage, uh, furniture, clothing, accessories, etc. And a really interesting fact is that in the mid-60s, the Aerological Society in Switzerland took this material, which is quartz, uh, as an instrument to try and measure time. And they passed an electrical current through a tiny chip of this and observed that it vibrated at a really precise rate and frequency. And they christened it Beta 1, and it was, in fact, the birth of the quartz watch. Um, that innovation has spread like wildfire. These are what the watches looked like. They're not particularly pretty and beautiful, but they are very accurate in terms of the time that they can tell. And they make that time accessible to many people. This is what watches used to look like. They were mechanical, they were more beautiful, they were more aesthetic. What's fascinating to know is that in that short period from 67 to the year 2000, only 15% of watches by then were mechanical. The rest were quartz and electronic. And, you know, they're not particularly beautiful things to look at. Obviously, if you wind forward, you can say that the technologies in watches has developed massively since then. And this is an example from TAG. It's the micro girder. It costs about $80,000. And it's accurate to one ten thousandth of a second. Now, that sounds fantastic until you actually think about what that means. It means that if you want to tell the time, you have to add the minutes to the seconds to the tenth of the seconds to the ten thousandth of a second to understand what time it is. Now, that might sound simple, but when you realize that this is what the watch actually looks like, And that is the actual movement. So you can see how difficult it'll be to do that calculation unless you stop it. Of course, if you stop it, you can work out the minutes of everything else. But in the time it's taken you to do that, obviously that little dial should have gone round a few thousand times. So you can see the problem. Although it's fantastically accurate, it's virtually impossible to tell the time with it. <laughs> it might be relevant if you're doing something where accuracy and speed is critical and you have to know the time really precisely, but it's very unlikely that you would be using a wristwatch for that, there'd be some other sort of instrument that is controlling the plane. The reality is that in luxury, we place much more value on simple technology. 
things that operate at a much more sort of human level that in many ways sort of mimic the heart, the humanity, the pace of life that is accessible and simple in terms of technology. It's why we like and appreciate grandfather clocks and clockwork. And when it's elevated above the practical and simple technologies in a thing that is of an object of beauty and craft, then that you create something that is precious, that is true luxury, that takes time to create. It takes craft and skill. It's not something that can be made by machines. And it's not something that has high technology inside it. The same is true of something like this. Uh, Jeanneau mentioned uh, luxury is not about price and defining things that are practical. I mean, this is probably about the most eccentric watch you can ever see in the world, the Bugatti. From most angles, you can't even tell the time on it. But it's because an eccentric designer said, this is a car for driving a watch. So you look at it when your hands are on the wheel, and you can see the dial from that position only. It's crazy, but it's very expensive, it's very beautiful, and it's limited edition, and it's a true luxury watch. This doesn't mean that things have to be old in their style and the materials. Luxury can also be very contemporary. Interestingly, this Ricard Mill watch is the one that Nadal wears. It's the lightest watch in the world at under 20 grams. It's incredibly expensive, but it's actually about true performance. It's a shock-absorbing watch. It's handmade. The mechanism is handmade. It's a beautiful thing. They only make 30, 40 of these watches. He obviously advertises it, uses it, but the real performance thing it delivers is that it's so light he hardly notices it's on his wrist. It can absorb the shock every time he hits it, a ball with the racket. So it's not being affected by any of those factors. It tells time perfectly. So this is, a, for what we see as a very high-level performance watch, not as a luxury watch. There's another dimension to luxury in watches which is nothing to do with the mechanism and the movement at all. It's actually to do with the artistry of the jeweler, the craft, the skill, to add something really beautiful in terms of a design and a look. And the secret panda is in fact a watch, although you wouldn't know it, until the panda moves back and you can actually see the watch beneath it. Again, these are things that are exhibiting really excellent skills in terms of craftsmanship and artistry. So our first observation is that in some ways there is a diametrically opposed uh, value to when you introduce technology into luxury. It devalues and detracts. Whereas if you have craftsmanship, simple technology that's elevated to a true art form to things that are beautiful as well as functional, that's when you get true luxury and real value. So is that universally true? Um, unfortunately not, because many of us in this room at Imagination work for automotive clients. They have luxury products. So the question is, if you're in a sector where power and performance and those sorts of dimensions are central to why people buy things, is there a role for technology and luxury? And if there is, how does it work? So if it's a top performance car or a top performance yacht, I mean, these things are made of carbon, they're controlled by lasers, they've got special sail shapes. They're very, very advanced, but they've got nothing to do with luxury. They're about high performance. You go on one of these boats, you get beaten to bits. They're crashing about, they're noisy, they're uncomfortable. Luxury is not about all the technology in that. Luxury is about hiding the technology, 
creating a sense of luxury through calmness, a sense of control, making the technology invisible. This is what luxury looks like on a mega yacht. It has all the capability to deliver speed, power, but it could be operated by a single individual at the touch of a button. It's a Wally yacht. They specialize in really innovative high tech, but it's hidden. They and other people in the luxury sector in high technology products understand that what they're doing is not communicating about features of technology. They're actually tapping into something really fundamental in luxury, which is the privilege and the pleasure that we get from escaping from all that crap. It's actually about cocooning. It's about connecting with your nature, things that are simple, giving yourself time. That's what true luxury is about. And the brands that understand that and how to translate that into a highly technology-rich product are the ones that succeed in luxury. A driving and core principle of Rolls-Royce design is the power of simplicity. They have advanced technology galore. They have head-up displays, they have thermal imaging, they have park assist. You wouldn't know any of it was there. It's all hidden behind walnut. There's a screen that will revolve from behind the walnut when you want it to, but the rest of the time it's hidden out of view. So it just feels like this little sort of cocoon of luxury, a sanctuary of peace and tranquility. And they talk about it being uncluttered, cosseted, a place to enjoy spending time. How many other brands in cars talk about a place to enjoy spending time? That's about understanding luxury. It's what the Range Rover understand when they're talking about the ultimate, most capable four-wheel drive vehicle in the world. It has more technology to drive that capability to help it go over any terrain effortlessly than any other vehicle in the world and any other vehicle that they've produced before. But they've actually reduced all the visible technology, the switches, the knobs, the flashing lights, by 50% from pre previous models. It's because they know that they want the technology to work simply and intuitively and for the driver to feel it's effortless. Nothing they have to do, it's done for them. Likewise in Jaguar, a high performance vehicle delivering refinement and high performance but without a sense of all that grind and grit that you have to go through in a rally car. It's about elegance and floating. So I guess what we're saying is that in sectors that have advanced technology, it's truly about understanding how to use it, where to incorporate it, how to exploit the power of simplicity and to give people that cosseted luxury feeling that they're completely in control and that they can tap into the lecture the, the technology, but it's intuitive and simple. The next thing that we wanted to look at is, okay, if there are categories where technology seems to destroy luxury and categories where it needs to be there, how does it apply when you're talking about things like digital channels? And we know this is a very challenging area for many luxury brands because they're sort of caught in this dilemma where they know that Embracing digital channels means giving accessibility when they're supposed to be about exclusivity. But we think there is a real opportunity for luxury brands to embrace digital channels. And if you think about lots of the emerging markets and some of the targets that we saw earlier on about how those luxury buyers are changing, increasingly they want to embrace technology. So we have to understand how to use it in a luxury way. So. Luxury brands that are facing that sort of ever snapping high street uh, mass market that seems to be mimicking many of their sort of values, how do they separate themselves out and keep the distance from the mass market? Well, in terms of technology and using digital channels, they can do it, but they just need to do it differently. They can't use it in the same way as uh, mass market brands. So they should avoid using it simply as a sort of atmosphere creator and an attractor. Fantastica. These are high street brands. Up, 
And for them, it's about drawing people to the brand, to the product. And when they're online, they're very much about using digital channels to create sales rapidly. It's about getting simpler, faster ways to buy. Luxury does not play in that game. Luxury is a different product and experience altogether. So whereas the mass market brands, you go online, the first thing you see is the products that you can buy. Um, Abercrombie's idea of experience is nothing more substantial and significant than the experience of how their sort of greeters develop their muscles <laughs> and can stand around the shops. I mean, how shallow is that? They have a role, they're very successful, but they're not luxury. The same for Zara. If you look at their shops, they're beautiful. They've got lots of the luxury values. But in digital channels, they're again about selling rapidly, quickly, things that are going to go out of fashion. They have inspiration of this year's collection. The next thing you see is, what can I buy? What, what basket do I put it in? Off I go. I'm in and out quickly. Luxury brands behave in a very different way. Uh, Jean-Paul spoke about luxury brands increasingly acquiring the suppliers and the craft skills that deliver their exclusivity. This is a great example of these two brands doing exactly that and then celebrating that artisan expertise in digital channels. I think you can see where it's going. It's all about the handcraft, the skill, the individual things that can't be mass produced. They're beautiful, they become collector's items. A brand that you could say in this market may be a little sort of tired for older people has really re-energized itself in terms of communicating its brand values and heritage. And in fact, Alfred Dunhill don't even talk about the products, they talk about the values of the brand. They communicate through the eyes of a contemporary British gentleman about culture, refinement, art. So when you go online, you'll see these, this collection of beautifully observed pieces. This one is about a musician and how he feels about playing a violin yes, me, concert. Um, if you get a big public who enjoy your performances and you play many concerts to sell out audiences, that's sort of an ultimate goal, without doubt. But even when I when I really feel like I'm on top of in, you know on top of the violin, I really feel a good sense of mastery. And even if I give a performance, you know, if say I'm playing a Brahms violin sonata, and I don't know, if I'm playing to 25 people in a small place, it's irrelevant where it is or you know how high profile it is. It was a piece of history. It never actually happened. The unmistakable song of 12 cylinders in full cry. It's just a phenomenal piece of machinery. Great proportion. Almost aeronautical in its purity. One of the fastest cars ever made for the time. Art, design, the sort of almost the heraldry of the night, the adventure of discovering places that people have never been to, the danger. All sorts of little things over many expeditions have caused failure doing Everest. I'd spent two months you know, going up and down, up and down, and from the Nepalese side, when at about 28,500 feet, somewhere above the South Col, um, came to the body of a, of a guy, a really nice guy called um, Rob Milne. And in this case, it's the artisan artistry when you of an individual. The early 20th century, there was a real kind of sense of quality attached to travelling. Every, every journey would have been a romantic adventure, exploring kind of the, the world that hadn't been seen before. I thought it would be really nice to. So, nothing to do with 
the products that they're specifically selling, but all about their values and their worldview and asking you to share in that and to be part of that when you buy their products. I think it's been taken to another level in terms of the digital ecosystem when you talk about how Burberry have used these channels. They have all the history, the founder, the, the story of Gabardine, how it was used genuinely to make coats that performed effectively in the trenches or resisted the wind when they were flying. But they've gone beyond that. They've said, that's the heritage part of it. It's real, it's authentic. But there's a true story still being told today, live online. There are brilliant photographers taking portraits of people in these wonderful sharp coats. There are individuals submitting their photographs of their life, their coats, and you can design a personalized version of these Macs yourself, online and in store. The other thing that's really interesting is that they've associated themselves with contemporary music, but not in the usual way, which is just sort of borrowing the interest of youthful enthusiasm and music and connection. They've got a very particular version of music that they connect with, and it's very deliberately acoustic. They've unplugged the bands from all that sort of technology and wizardry and said, let's get back to the raw artistry, the musicianship, the beauty of people singing in really simple ways. So they disconnect people from all the bands from all of that sort of elaborate lights and stage and everything and strip it back to something truly authentic and interesting. Thank you. So, although I could listen to that for much longer, um, it's important to recognise that they're not just doing that at a superficial level. They use it as a really powerful asset. So when they have global events launching the new collections, the sophisticated, high-end clothing, they also have the live performances from these bands in that very sort of unplugged way that adds something really startling and enjoyable into what would otherwise be quite a sort of sterile, although exciting and glossy experience. So this is what it looks like when they pull the things together for Burberry Live. I don't know whether you noticed in that the number of people in that live audience filming what was happening on their phones, recording it, sharing it with friends, keeping it for themselves. It's about being able to engage with the audience that's live, but also to engage beyond that and to reach a bigger audience. All of that comes together in an experience which is exceptional in store. If you look at the flagship store in Regent Street,
the great thing is they can have live events in the store, they can connect to live shows the other side of the world, they'll invite guests into that space, they use iPads to shop the collections that are being shown live the other side of the world. But best of all, they use the technology in a really relevant and compelling way. They use RFID technology, so you can take an item off a rail and walk towards one of those screens, and it'll tell you all about how it was made, how it was designed, what it looks like on the catwalk. You can get the whole story of the product. Uh, that sounds simple, but it's a massive undertaking to do that and to deliver it. But one of the key things that they're doing there is controlling the customer experience through the digital technology. They know they've got thousands of product lines to train their staff to deliver in the right voice, in the right way, the quality story of those individual products is massively difficult. But they're using a digital channel to take that burden away from those people. And fascinatingly, what that does is liberates the staff to engage with the customers in a very sort of warm and friendly way and to meet and explore their needs. So the digital world just sort of hands over seamlessly to that one-to-one -one connection. That isn't something that's just happened. It's something that they've planned very deliberately. And we've got this clip from Christopher Bailey talking about the importance of that warmth and that service and how they plan to deliver it. Burberry is a, is a, you know, it's a luxury company, but that can still be a warm, embracing, welcoming, uh, and should be a warm, embracing, um, engaging experience. Uh, you know, you, you should be met with a smile. You know, you should be made to feel welcome. You know, you, you, it should be a warm atmosphere, you know. If you think about how many brands, I mean, even in the high street, the Abercrombies, you go in there and they ignore you. They don't give a shit until you're at the till. <laughs> Whereas these guys embrace you. They engage with you. They meet your needs. That's about understanding what luxury experience is about. And there's one extra level in luxury. So there's the, the knowledge that the individuals have. They have the technology at their fingertips. They can tell you about products that aren't available in stock, when it can be delivered to you. They can deliver it to your home. They can tell you about it. And at another level, when you're buying really bespoke individual pieces that cost an absolute fortune. And if we go back to the sort of personal shopper type services in luxury watches, where there may only be 10 watches made for the whole world. Collectors are interested in them, but they don't know exactly what the watch is, what it looks like. There's an ability to demonstrate through digital technology exactly what it is, how it's made, why it's beautiful, why it's worth so much. So if we were to say, is luxury history, is there a role for technology? Certainly in some categories, if you start introducing too much technology, you will definitely kill the luxury. But there are others where lu luxury is about the technology and innovation. It's part of it. It has to be part of it. But it needs to be hidden. It needs to be kept simple, intuitive, and engaging, and a pleasant place to be. Then outside of those sort of product categories, can luxury embrace the new digital channels, apparently squaring the circle and making the brands accessible, but still creating an exclusivity that separates them out from the mass market? We think there is an opportunity to do that. If you do it well, if you understand how to use those channels to tell the right stories about the craftsmanship, the authenticity, the heritage, and to reach people in the right way. And then lastly, and crucially, if you marry that technology with a true experience of service, then the luxury brands are not writing themselves into history. They're writing themselves a very successful and profitable future. Thank you.